fascinating as India's lands are, there are equally magnificent wonders that lie beneath its oceans. Flanked by three expanses of water, the Indian Peninsula has been given a plethora of marine bounties. Oceans influence us no matter where we live, from regulating the weather to fueling our economy with its living and mineral resources. And so, geoscientists from India are plunging to the depths of its oceans to uncover their truths from their morphology to their seismicity to the extraordinary life that thrives. Scientists are using the most cutting-edge instrumentation to observe the seas from down below and up above. Come, take a dive as we explore India's incredible marine resources along with India's finest researchers. The Final Frontier That's how we have always referred to the most outlying horizons of research. Usually, we imagine outer space, the stars and galaxies as this frontier. But there is another one, right here on planet Earth. The oceans are the last frontiers. And that is where the excitement of exploring is the, these oceans comes into picture. Now if you look at the present scenario, if you look at uh, the water mass which is there on this planet Earth, which is 71%, we have explored only 10% of the oceans globally. And therefore, there is a huge scope to understand this ocean in more exciting way, to make more and more findings in terms of all kinds of living and non-living resources. India is surrounded on three sides with water, making marine science an invaluable pursuit. That's why ocean research is the primary mission of the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography or NIO. So many exciting things are there. Entire life the another kind of world is existing in the ocean, unexplored. So if you see ocean, it's not only a water mass, it contains so many things. It's a big repository of carbon. So if it controls the climate. There could be source of lot of nutrition, lot of medicinal plants, that whole entire biology is there. So mineral resources are there. This needs to be explored and needs to be exploited. Some of the key questions marine researchers ask are, how much do we know about the world underwater? Does it look like land or is it different? What do we know about the seafloor's design? These are questions best answered by the science of bathymetry. In many ways, the seafloor resembles land surfaces, with often higher mountains and deeper valleys found anywhere on land. As continents give way to water, we see the continental shelf recede to continental slopes. Flatbed zones are called abyssal plains. There are elevated mountain-like peaks called sea mounts and the tops of volcanic formations that form islands. There are mountain ridges or low and narrow elevations with steep-sided plunges known as rift valleys. Trenches are long, deep depressions in the ocean floor. Chilika Lake in North Odisha is a brackish water lagoon, periodically fed by water from the Bay of Bengal and represents an important marine ecosystem next to Sundarban Delta. Most significantly for geologists, there are plate boundaries and fault lines affected by the Earth's plate tectonics, just like on land. Rises along these fault lines are typically observed as mid-oceanic ridges. These fault lines become regions of tremendous seismic activity, from tremors and plate movements to volcanic eruptions along the seams. But the seafloor is also radically different from land. At its deepest, these worlds have no visible light and experience tremendously high pressures. Seafloor is an interface between the hydrosphere and lithosphere. 
So there are two different processes are running over there. So if you know the bathymetry, you can understand the processes very well. That is one advantage. As far as the utility of the bathymetry data, it is any scientific studies, you need bathymetry. But how can one study these features in depths that range from a few meters to thousands? For this, marine geologists use sound-based technologies like multi-beam echo sounders and India was one of the first to get it in the late 1980s. NIO got multi-beam in 1989. They installed the multi-beam with the help of Ministry of Earth Science to have funded us to survey the multi-beam system in the Central Indian Ocean Basin. Now all the countries, all the ship, scientific ship vessel should have a multi-beam. But 1989 when it started, it's a very fantastic news, information. Uh, we, that time India was the third or fourth probably in a very, within, very forerunner among them. This technology involves sending acoustic or sound signals down from a ship to the sea floor. These multi-beamed signals sweep a wide area of the bed and bounce back up to receivers on the ship. Depending on how they bounce back, scientists can tell about the different features on the seafloor as well as any seismic activity. Back in the lab, this information is used to create maps and some of these maps tell quite an interesting story about our oceans. The feature which you are looking on the screen here is a data collected using a multi-beam sonar. Right? And uh, this particular feature has been collected from the shallow water regions. When I say shallow water regions, uh, it is uh, starting at a water depth of 60 meters, going down up to 80 and slightly more than that. And the undulations which you are seeing here, they are a result of sea level rise. Okay? Now, to give an history of this sea level rise, certain years uh, in the geological past, our shore was almost 120 kilometers away from what it is at present. Right? So, over the period of time, as the sea level started increasing, there was a transgression of the sea into the land area and slowly, slowly the land mass started submerging into the water. Now, when this transgression takes place, there is an intense interaction between the land and the sea because of the waves and the currents and uh, as slowly this is going below the water different features get formed okay now you can see the step like structure here this is because there are some periods where there is not a very intense interaction between the transgression okay there you can see a plane structure but if there was an intense wave action then there will be a mold kind of formation or the lagoon kind of formation which you can see here as rises. Okay? And these are typical features which are formed and uh, as you go deeper and deeper these things will be different because in the geological past that area was already submerged. There's a lot these scientists can tell, especially about one of our most magnificent oceans, the Indian Ocean. Did you know that the Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean in the world? It stretches for more than 10,000 kilometers and has an area of about 73,440,000 square kilometers. In total, it covers nearly 20% of the Earth's surface. It's also the youngest ocean and scientists are just beginning to uncover its incredible history. The story begins with the breakup of the southern supercontinent Gondwana, which started 180 million years ago when the landmass containing the future Madagascar, Australia, India and Antarctica split from the African coast. 140 million years ago, the Indian Ocean first opened up. But it was only after Australia started to separate from Madagascar and India 120 million years ago and when India started to separate from Madagascar 80 million years ago that the Indian Basin was formed largely by the phenomenon of seafloor spreading. 
By 36 million years ago, the Indian Ocean had taken on its present configuration. We see the results of this birthing process at ridges, Y-shaped scars that indicate that this was the point where molten material rose from the core of the earth to the ocean floor, leading to its expansion. These ridges are often the sites of great seismic activity. Marine researchers might observe plumes of molten material gushing out like underwater volcanoes. These might be the sites for gases to escape from deep inside the Earth. And sometimes there may be increased seismic action leading to tremors in the ocean floor and even tsunamis. Oceanographers have also discovered remnants of old civilization under the sea off the coast of Dwarka in Gujarat and off the coast of Mahabalipuram in Tamil Nadu. These submerged ancient cities and temples are testimony to sea level changes in the youngest period of Holocene recently designated as Meghalayan time. Over 400 million Indians live along its coastline many of them under the threat of a possible tsunami event like the kind that hit in 2004 and wiped out nearly 18,000 people. In response, the National Tsunami Early Warning Center was set up at Inkoys, Hyderabad. They use remote sensing satellites that act like CCTVs of the sea floor. If you take the Indian Ocean, we have the two tsunami genic zones. Uh, like one is called Andaman Nicobar Sumatra region in the Bay of Bengal side, another one is called uh, Makran zone in the Arabian Sea, so near to Pakistan and near Gujarat coast. Accordingly, we have the numerical simulations. If suppose tsunami generated somewhere in this place, and we have the information like when it is going to hit particular coast, wave height as well as the arrival time of the tsunami. Accordingly, we will issue the bulletins to the disaster management officials. Generally, we have issued to the Minister of Home Affairs, National Disaster Management Authorities, NDMA, as well as uh, State Emergency Operations Centers, District Emergency Operations Centers. While agencies like INCOIS use satellite technology to plunge to the Indian Ocean's depths, this team at NIO has just returned from a deep water mission, one that required the use of AUVs or Autonomous Underwater Vehicles. When deployed, these instruments can plunge to tremendous depths, over thousands of meters, to enter worlds that are unlike anything on land. Here, in this high-pressure, low-temperature world, there are new sights and new sounds. These instruments are fitted with high-resolution camera and capable of recording sound very precisely, like these picked up by the bioacoustics team of NIO. These are sounds of marine life, species of fish, whales, toads, etc. communicating with each other underwater. Sounds we will never be able to hear on land. It was on explorations such as these that NIO scientists discovered not just new sounds, but something so precious it could compete with mineral mines on land. Republic Day, 1981. The RV Gaveshni carries an elite team of marine scientists into the deep waters of the Indian Ocean. By the time this team returns to shore, they will have picked up the first samples of a precious mineral resource. These are polymetallic nodules, or PMN, rather simple-looking rock-like objects found at depths of up to 4 to 5 kilometers. The polymetallic nodules is a conglomeration of minerals, many minerals like manganese, iron, copper, nickel, cobalt and other minerals like lead, zinc and other things. India is the only third world country which established its flagship in the Indian Ocean in the polymetallic nodules project. Inside NIO's exclusive sample vaults are polymetallic nodules from over 75 expeditions that collected over 300 million tons of PMN. But what exactly are they? 
next find out more about these special bounties of the ocean that took millions of years to create with depletion of surface mineral resources the ocean bottom is being explored for new mineral wealth like manganese nodules and gas hydrates for meeting our energy requirements these are resources for the future on the other hand biological resources of the marine realm offer substantial gain to the country's economy since the 1980s india has unearthed millions of tons of a precious mineral resource known as pmn or polymetallic nodules from the bottom of the indian ocean these ball like minerals are a rich source of metals like manganese nickel and cobalt etc how are they formed and how do they come to reside deep inside the indian ocean suppose you take a stroll on the sea bed at a depth of 5 km or the 5000 m water depth you'll come across a different kind of metals lying on the sea floor for example a shark tooth or a broken piece of pumice or a cliff fragments broken nodules etc with given time the hydrogenic deposits that is the metals uh, and oxygen coming out from the precipitation from sea water will tend to get accreted on this shark tooth and tends to form a thick oxide layer here now this we call is encrustations but in case of the nodular ones we call them as polymeric nodules here now these nodules can be of two morphology as it can be very rough like in this manner or can be quite smooth like a cannon ball and as regards the size it can vary from 2 cm to as large as 8 cm in size now once you cut the nodule we'll get this fine variation which can be seen under the microscope in the center you have the nucleus where where in this case is the altered rock fragments and around with there will be layers of manganese and iron manganese and iron it's very similar to the uh, growth rings of the tree but in case of that you can find the age whereas here we can find the accretionary process what is formed so this will give us a hint from where the source of the metals have come from and how long it has taken to form the thickness now coming to the thickness of the nodules we generally accept that for 1 mm it takes about 1 million years polymetallic nodules are not the only million year secrets the seafloor holds in order to discover them indian oceanographers have developed their own technologies and instruments when we are talking about all the shallow water areas we can somehow manage with small vessels which uh, like we can use some of the fishing trawlers or some of the small vessels which we can hire but if you want to pursue ocean research in its total capacity and the requirements if you want to collect different kinds of data for different kinds of studies encompassing all the fields of sciences in the oceanography then a fully capable instrumented ocean going vessel is a requirement and that was the reason why we thought that nio must have its own vessel and in particular a vessel which could be built in india and that was our aim and that's what we did sindhu sadhana a specialized and highly advanced ship that contains all the instrumentation and lab facilities to conduct state of the art marine science and this was the first time that a research vessel which is normally a forte of all the european countries americans singapore china this was the first attempt on the part of government of india to build this vessel indigenously completely and we are very proud of that with a new research vessel india's marine researchers can begin to unearth wondrous new worlds and most recently they have made some discoveries that open a new window into life 5000 meters underwater we all know that 3/4 of the planet is covered with water but exactly how deep is the oceanic realm much of human activity like fishing etc happens at around 40 meters depth due to extreme water pressure it is unsafe for human beings to go beyond 100 meters blue whales don't swim deeper than 500 meters but the oceans go deeper still at depths over 4000 meters everything is dark 
water pressure is at 11,000 pounds per square inch and there is no oxygen. They can fit an inverted Mount Everest in its waters. Yet, there is life. And that is what NIO's scientists discovered in their most recent expeditions in the Indian Ocean. The Krishna Godavari Basin. This region is known for its reserves of oil and natural gas. Using water imaging and other techniques, NIO scientists found evidences of a geological feature known as cold seep. You could see uh, very big uh, pillars of gases, mostly methane, that's reaching to the height of 700 meters almost. And when gas seeps out, from sediment like that, it creates its own specialized ecosystem, very special ecosystem and that we called as the cold seep ecosystem. Why cold seep? Because it is a bottom water is cold. Cold seeps are of great interest because they hold out hope for the presence of fossil fuels. But there is another reason. Around cold seeps, unique life develops. Life that grows in such extraordinary conditions they are almost like aliens. Let's find out more after the break. India's oceans and sea floors are veritable vaults of mineral and geological wonder. Recently, marine geologists uncovered a colony of unique life forms in the Krishna Godavari Basin. These are samples collected from 5,000 meters under the Indian Ocean. These creatures may look familiar to the species we see in shallower waters, but they are mega in size. This is because, unlike land species, which use sunlight and oxygen to thrive, these ones live in darkness with gases, chemicals like hydrogen sulfide and methane. In the cold sip region, so much of hydrogen sulfide is produced at close to the sedimentary interface and these organisms basically survive on those hydrogen sulfide and uh, methane that is produced. So these organisms inside their body, body tissues, uh, they have specialized cells which we call bacteriocyte cells. Uh, as you can see these shells which we call as the calyptogena shells belonging to the family called vesicomity family. These are such extraordinarily large shells. They are also known as calyptogena magnifica, very large shells. These are also belong to Thyacidity family, they are also so large. So how they grow so large? Because uh, so much of food is produced inside their body by microbial activities, microbial processes. You can see in this one, like this is a pathimodulus muscle shell and this is uh, preserved in this uh, preservative solution and in that you can see the, a fold like this. This is basically called the gill muscles or gill tissues. In that there are cells, specialized cells which host the bacterial community. These bacterial communities are mostly of two types. One is called sulfur, sulfide oxidizing bacteria, another the methane oxidizing bacteria. So by the oxidation process, they generate a lot of energy and that energy is then used in producing the food. Marine wonders like these are only just beginning to be understood as over 70 to 80 percent of India's oceans are yet to be completely known. Oceanographers and marine researchers are exploring new frontiers every day, venturing deep into the geological unknown. Who knows what the next expedition will bring? Please mail your feedback on info at the rate vigyanprasar.gov.in you can also write to us on Vigyan Prasar A50 Institutional Area, Sector 62, Noida, Uttar Pradesh, 201309. For more information about our programs, please visit our website www.vigyanprasar.gov.in.